Hello, my name is Kieran. I'm the host of Eerie Earth. I'm also the writer and director of the production you are about to hear. The Fallen has been in production for a very, very long time. I am very pleased to be able to share it with you now. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the first episode of The Fallen. Thick black clouds filled the sky, threatening rain to fall on the already sodden ground below. The bright yellow glow from the city illuminated the sky as the flames clawed at the heavens, climbing on the husks of the buildings, trying to touch the clouds as if to engulf them too. Large embers soaring high above their camp, a crude base which a small group of survivors had erected in a vain attempt to rebuild a community. Decrepit tents made from a disused tarp found on an abandoned building site. Frayed ropes held them down against the battering wind. The group had found and scavenged a few supplies which made living in the small encampment a little bit easier, but hunger was their biggest enemy next to the army of the dead which had swarmed the city. Only the day before their camp was set upon by a horde of the shambling corpses as they meandered through the park, looking for fresh meat to fill their rotten bellies. In the centre of the camp, if you could call it that anymore, sat a tent which stood out from the destruction. A dull yellow light emanated from within. The glimmer from a gas lamp flickered on the crude tent, creating a warm glow, shadows dancing on the tarp, a rhythmical and relaxing show. Danny Cunningham lay on the uncomfortable wet floor, watching the flames from the lamp hanging on a rusted pole which held the tarp aloft, all thoughts of her current situation momentarily out of her head. Her jet black hair tied tightly into a ponytail, strands of loose hair falling onto her face as she lay on the hard floor in a pair of torn blue denim jeans and a filthy grey hoodie with the words Bristol University barely visible through the dirt and blood. She could hear the soft breathing from her little brother Calvin in the bed next to her. She turned to look over at her brother, moving gently to avoid waking him. He lay asleep on his back, his small form dwarfed by the length of the moth-bitten rickety camp bed, his mousy brown hair shaggy and unkept. He wore a t-shirt with his favourite spaceman plastered on it, his image tainted with blood and mud removing all innocence from the image, and his favourite red trousers which were covered in mud and blood lay across the bed. He was wrapped up in a torn raincoat that they had found in a car a week prior. She stroked his hair away from his face and smiled as he shifted in his sleep. A pang of guilt tugged at her heart as she gazed upon the small, innocent face of her little brother, who she'd sworn to protect throughout this horrendous event. She'd never really got on with her brother. they had always argued. He would be in her room going through her things, reading her diary. They would fight constantly, and Danny would always get the blame for it. Cal could do no wrong. But now, things had changed. They had no time to fight or argue. They only had each other. For three months before the fall, they had been living in Edinburgh with their auntie in a small three-bedroom apartment. Just until they got settled, or so her mother kept telling her. They moved from Bristol, where they were living in a large five-bedroom house, a large back garden, plenty of space for Calvin to play, and Danny had her own room, her own space, her own piece of paradise. That's what she thought. When her father died of a short illness, the doctors didn't even know what it was and were unable to treat it. It was an illness that several people had contracted, but no one knew where it came from or what had caused it. Danny was affected a lot by the loss of her father. They were extremely close, and she would often spend nights with her dad where they would just stay up into the small hours in the morning, just talking about everything and nothing. They were the best of friends. The family was rocked by his death. Danny's mother left her job as a PA for a large advertising company, well paid with great benefits, because she couldn't bear to be at work while everyone dealt with everything that was going on. Danny dropped out of university, she couldn't concentrate on her studies, and she was on track to become a doctor, but that was put on hold while she dealt with everything that was happening. Even Cal was playing up, getting into fights at school, being rude to the teachers, which was totally out of character. He was usually a very polite and docile boy. 
The decision was made to move in with her auntie who lived in Edinburgh. She was a personal trainer and moved to Scotland for a guy that she met on a dating app. To no surprise to Danny nor her mother, it didn't work out. So she decided to focus on herself, teaching her self-help and yoga and meditation, all things that Danny thought were a load of rubbish. But if it made her auntie happy, then fine. But now Edinburgh was gone, lost to the dead. It fell quickly, almost overnight. Refugee camps and emergency medical tents had popped up in any green area of the city. Greyfriars Kirkyard had become a military zone where doctors and scientists were trying to figure out what the hell happened. Soldiers patrolled the area, preventing anyone from entering. Martial law was in full effect almost straight away. It felt like the government panicked and told the army to sort it out by any means necessary. Danny rolled onto her back and watched the waltzing flames in the lantern as the memory of the outbreak slowly faded into her mind. She remembers sitting on the sofa with her legs tucked up underneath her and her head resting on a soft, fluffy pillow. Her eyes were getting heavy. Next to her, her mother was knitting something, the bright-coloured wool hanging down onto the floor. She had no idea what her mother was making, but was always impressed when suddenly she would hand her a woolen jumper that she had made, or gave Calvin a hat for the winter. Her auntie was in the kitchen making the trio a cup of tea, bringing the cups through. The light from the television lit up the room with a flickering glow, and the show was something about people being in a tent, baking cakes and treats. Most of them were great, but some were just terrible. But it really made Danny hungry. Calvin could be heard in the next room playing with his toys, his soft voice barely audible over the sound of the TV. A sleep started to take hold of Danny. She was jolted awake when suddenly the show went off and the picture was replaced with the words, Emergency Broadcast. The trio looked to each other with a confused expression plastered on their faces. Danny's mother lowered her knitting, resting it on her lap, picking up the mug from the table and bringing it to her lips, her eyes never leaving the TV. There were three loud tones which erupted from the screen, almost deafening. Eventually, the news reporter appeared on the screen, dishevelled and unkept. His hair was scruffy and his tie was undone. His shirt was wrinkled and torn. Danny sat up. Her auntie watched the pair and then turned her attention to the TV. The reporter cleared his throat and shuffled a few bits of paper and began to speak. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is an emergency broadcast. Residents are advised that a government-enforced curfew is now in effect. Martial law is in effect following the announcement from the World Health Organization who have declared a state of emergency. As it appears, the dead are rising and feeding on the living. I will repeat, the dead are rising and feeding on the living. If you or a loved one has been bitten or scratched, you must isolate yourself immediately and wait until help arrives. Should you come across anyone who is infected or any of the dead, you must remove the head and destroy the brain. I repeat, remove the head and destroy the brain. If you can get to one of the transports, then make your way to one now, but if not, try and get to one of our checkpoints. If you are not able to leave your home, you must stay indoors and stay safe and wait for help to arrive. This channel will stay live for as long as possible to bring you the most up-to-date news as it happens. I wish you good luck. That story again. Danny's mother turned off the TV and the three sat in silence for a moment, shock plastered on their faces, unable to speak, no words coming into their minds. They continued to sit, allowing the news to sink in. Margaret, Danny's mother, was the first to move, jumping to her feet. It was the quickest that Danny had seen her move in months, her knitting clattering on the floor in a woolen heap. I knew it. I knew something was off. I told you, Olivia. I told you the other day that something was off. I didn't think it would be like this. We need to leave. We need to go to one of those safe places the guy mentioned. Mum, we can't leave. The man on the TV told us we had to stay indoors. We will be safe if we stay inside. Whatever is going on out there, we will be safe in here. No. He said if you can get to one of the checkpoints or transports to get there, we're going. I am not arguing, Daniela. Pack up your things, grab your brother, we are leaving. Where's my phone? Who's moved my phone? Oh, God's sake, where am I? Guys, stop a minute. Let's just think. 
The guy on the news told us we had to stay inside. I'm not going anywhere and neither are you. And besides, we don't even know where those checkpoints or transports are. We're not going to be running around the city for no reason while the dead stalk the living. It's probably all a hoax anyway. Who do you think you're speaking to? I am your mother. You will do as you are told. We are going to one of those transports. I will not tell you again. And I find it very unlikely that it is an oak, Daniela. Did you not see what the guy looked like? And why would they trick us with that? Because it's October. It's nearly Halloween. Perhaps it's a Halloween trick. Sick joke if you ask me. No one did ask you. And anyway, Mum, you're not asking me to clean my room here. You're asking me to risk my life, to risk yours, to risk Olivia's and Cal's. Do you really want to send Cal out there with those... those things? He's five! The guy on the TV said that they're eating people. He can't see that shit! Look, I have noticed stuff all week. And I told you about it. I told you about Rosie's husband. You know, Rosie from the bingo. Well, he got ill, went to hospital and never came back. Similar illness to what Dad had. I raised my concerns with you, but you did not believe me. And now, now we're being told that stuff has happened. And again, you do not believe it. If we stay here, Daniela, we will miss one of the transports out of the city. Our opportunity to be safe. Guys, did you hear that? Daniela, I will not tell you again. Get your brother. We are leaving. Danny barged past her auntie and headed for the door that led to the bedrooms. As her hand touched the cold brass handle of the door, there was a large thump against the front door of the apartment, followed by a yelp from her auntie. The three women stopped and stared at each other in silence as another thud erupted from beyond the door. Olivia, Danny's auntie, inched closer, her heart thumping against her chest. A large bead of sweat trickled down her back. As her long red painted fingernails reached for the handle, her hand shaking uncontrollably, another loud thud greeted her as her fingers reached the handle and the door burst open, coming off the hinges, hitting her in the head and knocking her to the ground. Five figures filled the doorway, barging through, almost getting stuck. A horrendous stench filled the room, the smell of rotten meat mixed with body odour and a distinct stench of formaldehyde tugged at their nostrils, causing them all to retch. The five figures squeezed through the doorway, led by a balding man in a blood-covered hospital gown, tubes and needles sticking out of his pale arms, thick chunks of flesh hung loosely from his blackened teeth as his stubbly chin was caked in dried crimson. His blood-covered fingers clawed at the air as he stumbled through the doorway, lunging for Olivia, who had now gotten to her feet, oblivious that the attackers were coming through the door. As she turned around to be face to face with the oncoming nightmares, the balding man grabbed her by the shoulders, his head snapped back and he plunged his teeth into her face, chewing loudly as Olivia's muffled, gargled screams filled the air. The sound of moaning coming from the attackers drowned out the dying screams from Olivia as the man pushed her to the ground and began to feast on her. The four other intruders stepped over their leaders, two men in smart suits, large wounds in their heads showing skull. They began to shuffle towards Margaret. Without hesitation or thinking, Danny lunged for her mother, grabbed her by the arm, darted into the kitchen, slamming the door behind them. The sounds of groaning and chewing could be heard from the other side of the door as a thudding began. Margaret threw herself against the door, tears streaming down her pale face as she tried to anchor herself against the door to stop the intruders from getting through. Her loud sobbing barely drowned out the sound of the frenzy from the other side of the door. She, she's gone. I can't, I can't believe she, she, she's gone. Just like that. Mum, listen to me. You need to pull yourself together. I am 
shitting myself too, but you need to find something to defend yourself with. Danny was rifling through the drawers, looking for something to use as a weapon, throwing useless utensils onto the floor from pizza cutters to whisks, until she removed a large, sharp butcher's knife and handed it to her mother, a long, serrated kitchen knife. Her mother shook her head as her daughter handed her the weapon, words unable to leave her lips. She swallowed hard, but it just seemed to bring more tears as she sobbed harder. The thumping and the scratching at the door getting louder. The wails and the moans from the dead was deafening. And what do you think we're going to do with these? The door burst open, nearly coming off the hinges, and the two smartly dressed creatures limped in, mouths open with their rotten teeth dripping with crimson fluid. Their stench filled the kitchen. Danny leapt into action without hesitation, plunging the butcher's knife into the cranium of the first creature and let out a yelp as the blade slid through the skin and into the skull, cranial fluid and blood spraying out all over her hand, the creature sinking to the ground as its pale, dead eyes stopped moving and the lifeless corpse crumpled like a deck of cards. The second smartly dressed man stumbled through the door, tripping on the lifeless corpse of his comrade and hitting the ground with a wet thud. That did not faze the creature as it kept coming, its filthy rotten fingers clawing at the ground, pulling itself towards Margaret's leg. Danny noticed that its fingernails popped off as it dug its fingers into the tiles to try and pull itself along the ground. As it slowly reached Margaret, its fingers clawed at her bare skin on her leg, its fingers ripping into her flesh. Thick red blood exploded out of the open wound as Margaret's blood-curdling bellow erupted through the apartment, clinging to the air. She watched as the monster tore at her muscles in her leg as she pulled himself closer to her, his teeth joining in as he chewed through the meat, crimson fluid bursting into his mouth, the blackened teeth tearing and pooling. Mum, no! Margaret continued to scream, which had attracted the attention of the rest of the monsters. Danny swung her foot hard, her bloody converse smacking the corpse square in the temple, unclamping its mouth, taking a large chunk of meat with it. The creature rolled on its back as her foot came down on her face, the soft tissue crumpling like glass. Blood and cranial fluid exploded up her leg, turning her jeans a sickly crimson colour. The fourth intruder started to shamble towards the kitchen. An overweight woman in a flowery blouse, now caked in blood, stumbled over pieces of furniture. Her curly grey hair matted and congealed on her face, the fresh blood from her recent meal smothering her face. Danny knelt down to tend to her mother, who was screaming and crying, pushing Danny away. Danny, you have to, to get your brother and go. It's, it's too late. Go. Mum, don't say that. I'm going to get you help. Come on. Listen to me. You have to go. You must be strong for Cal. Mum, enough! We will get you out! Look after him. Don't let anything happen to him. Mum, please! Promise me. Mum, enough! Danny! Promise me! I, I promise! I love you, darling. Now go. As Danny started to run, she watched the massive woman fall to her knees and start to feast. Danny watched on in horror as another creature joined the meal, tearing and pulling at the flesh of Margaret, pulling out her intestines and stomach and chomping down. Danny vomited in her mouth as she struggled to her feet and lunged out the door, stepping over the rotten corpses and stumbled to the door of the living room that led to the bedrooms. She fell against the door, bursting it open, slamming it shut behind her. And when she was relatively safe behind the door, she fell to her knees and began to sob loudly. After a few minutes of constant tears, Calvin appeared in front of her in his spaceman pyjamas, his hair ruffled and untidy. Danny stared up at her little brother from the floor. Chunks of meat and blood hung from her clothes. She paused for a second, threw her arms around her little brother and began to sob. Oh, Cal! <laughs> Through the sound of chomping and moaning, Danny was sure she heard talking and what sounded like gunshots, muffled, distant but distinct. 
She let go of Cal and crawled to the door, pressing her ear against the wood, her blood-covered hand resting next to her face as she concentrated on the sounds. Her hand was shaking uncontrollably as it rested against the door, and Danny noticed her whole body was shaking. The voices got closer and louder, when suddenly the apartment was filled with loud gunfire, explosions erupting through the room as loud male voices responded to each other. Danny stepped back from the door as it burst open, splintering from the doorframe, and three men flooded into the room, dressed in black jumpsuits and wearing black gas masks, which covered their faces, making them terrifying as they surrounded the shivering siblings. Each man was holding a heavy-looking assault rifle with a bright torch stuck to the undercarriage, and they pointed it in the face of the pair, blinding them slightly. On the ground! On the ground! Get on fucking ground! Okay, okay, calm down! Cal, get down! Sad! Any of them's got two assets. Girl and wee lad. <laughs> it looks like the lad has pissed himself. Oh, for God's sake, I would have some decorum. Have you been bitten? What? Look, it's a simple question. Does one of those creatures who killed who I can only assume to be your mother bite or scratch either of you? Fuck you! No, I have not been bitten. <laughs> You're very charming for a young lady. I like you. Uh, uh, sorry, they've uh, really done a number in here. One of the soldiers called back, his muffled voice barely audible underneath the mask. As he bent down to take a closer look at the mangled corpse of Danny's mother, large tear marks on her skin where meat had been pulled away from the bone and her insides were now spread all over the linoleum of the kitchen floor. He removed the pen from his pocket and used it to pick up some of the torn flesh and hold it up to his face to try and make sense of which body part it had come from. As he studied the dripping meat closer, he failed to notice the owner of the shredded skin jolt slightly as she began to reanimate. Her fingers twitched as the shredded arm swung up, grabbing the head of the soldier and he was pulled closer to an open maw as Margaret plunged her blackened teeth into his throat, ripping at the flesh and pulling long tendrils of skin and meat from his neck as blood spurted out like a fountain, adding to the sea of crimson that the bodies were now swimming in. He fell on his backside, grabbing his neck, trying in vain to stop the river of blood that was pouring from his neck as he gargled. Muffled screams filled the kitchen. He pushed himself back with his feet, which were slipping on the blood, he raised his rifle and clumsily fired at the corpse which was now trying to get to his feet, the bullets tearing through her face sending the cadaver back to the floor, landing with a slosh in a puddle of blood. The soldier stumbled to his feet clutching his neck, his sobbing getting louder as he approached the sergeant. Without a beat, the sergeant removed the handgun from his holster on his leg, aimed it at the soldier who was now pleading for his life. <coughs> Wait, wait, please. No, 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 sorry. Do you know the rules? A bullet roared out the gun and smashed the glass of the gas mask, ripping through the soldier's skull, his head snapping back, his lifeless body falling to the floor in a heap. Sarge, the kids. Abbott, deal with her. With pleasure, sir. Jesus Christ, Abbott, get a grip. That's not what I meant. Yeah, all right, pretty boy. Let you deal with them. It's okay, you can get up. Who the hell are you? What are you doing here? I'm Kirkham. He removed his pistol from his holster and laid it on the ground, then his rifle from his back and dropped it to the floor. He paused for a moment, then removed his gas mask, revealing a young man in his late twenties. His hair scruffy from the mask, and patches of dried blood in his face. He looked strained and tired, like he'd been awake for three nights straight, which he had been. He joined the army at sixteen, and was in his first year. He'd been posted out in Afghanistan, where he was the baby of the infantry unit. Within a week of being posted, he was forced to kill a man who came into their camp wearing an explosive vest. Before he knew it, he had raised his rifle and fired a shot into the man's head, killing him instantly. This is what he was trained to do, but that didn't make it any better. He suffered from horrendous nightmares every night following the event, and pleaded to be sent home, which eventually he could on medical grounds. As soon as he landed back in the UK, all this happened. He was dealing with a lot in his head and in the real world. Sometimes he would wonder how he coped, but he knew he had no choice. Sorry, Pete, and we're here to help. Help? Does that usually involve thrusting guns into the faces of children and forcing them to the ground? He's five, for God's sake. Yeah, uh, Abbott can be... A prick? <laughs> 
I was going to say heavy-handed, but prick works too. We're here looking for survivors. If you haven't heard, the city has gone sideways and we're trying to find anyone alive to take them to safety. Okay, so how bad is it? Fire and brimstone bad. The dead walking the earth and eating anything in sight? Not bad enough? So it's true? You've not noticed the city turn into shit? Yes, it's true. Edinburgh is gone. I'm from a team called the Crows who've been tasked with finding survivors, and to put it into perspective, you two are the only ones we've found. We have a base in Princess Street Gardens where we're to take anyone we find. What about the transports? Transports? You mean the ones that were for the rich and those who could afford to buy their place on them, whilst the poor and the undeserving were left to the city? Those ones? Yeah, they're gone. Left at the first opportunity. The base is the only haven left in the city. Look, we have to move. We can't stay here. The dead will be all over this place before we know it. Pete inched closer to Danny, but Danny grabbed the classic sword that was leaning against the wall and held it up to his face. Pete put his hands out in a defensive position. Don't come any closer! <laughs> wow, okay, Lancelot. Pete barged past Danny and headed to the window. He moved the lace curtain aside and placed his hands on the glass and peered out. The street below was littered with dead bodies, pools of blood and litter. Fire and smoke bellowed from several cars and the air was filled with the sounds of screams and gunfire. He couldn't see his sergeant or any of his comrades, but he did notice a lone zombie shambling amongst the carnage, his lifeless eyes darting around for his next meal, blood dripping from his jowls. He wore a blue shirt and a brown tie hung loosely around his neck. A suit jacket hung on his arms, torn and bloodied. His suit trousers had large holes in the legs and a sharp shard of bone poked out of his left knee and his leg was being dragged lazily behind him. Looks quiet out there. It'd be best to get moving. I'm not leaving. I'm not putting Cal at risk. I promised... I promised my mum... With all due respect, we can't stay here. The dead, as you've seen, have infiltrated this building and it really isn't safe. So I highly recommend you come with me, and I get you and your brother to safety. So what? We're just supposed to believe that those things out there are zombies. And what? Leave with you, and we all live, like, happily ever after. Zombies? Where are you getting that? Them? Out there? They're just junkies on a bad trip. That's what I told myself when I first saw one. When all this shit started happening, that's exactly what I said. Yes, they are zombies. Creatures of the night. The goddamn living dead. The sooner you accept that, the easier it'll be for you to survive. And anyway, Sarge says we're not to call them zombies. You must call them the infected. But see, I prefer calling them scabies. Makes them less threatening. Scabies, that's cute. Right, fine. I, I guess we haven't got much of a choice. Okay, action man. What is the plan? Well, still looks quiet out there. We should be okay to slip past any on the street there. Follow me. The three of them stepped into the living room. The smell of death permeated from every direction. Cal gasped at the carnage that greeted them. Blood everywhere, and body parts from the decaying corpses that lay lifeless in the heaps around the flat. Bullet holes in the walls where stray bullets missed their targets. Cal looked towards the kitchen, but before he could see the devoured body of his mother, Danny blocked his view with her body and guided him towards the door. As they got into the corridor, Pete raised his hand and the siblings stopped in their tracks. He stepped forward, his rifle raised to his eyes and he slowly started down the stone steps, taking each step gently, ensuring not to make a sound. When he was at the bottom, he gestured for the pair to follow. It's all clear! Come down! Quietly! Which they did, ensuring not to make a noise. As the pair waited for Pete to go down to the next set of stairs, Cal looked around at the bodies and the blood that littered the corridor. Bodies of their neighbours, people they saw on a daily basis. Blood sprayed up the walls and the bodies of their rotten assailants. The siblings bolted down the stairs as quietly as possible until they reached the front door, where they saw Pete leaning against it, peering through the gap. As they approached, he raised a finger to his lips and slowly opened the door onto the street. The stench of rotting flesh hit them like a tidal wave of foulness, causing Danny to recall in disgust. No, oh, that smell! Jesus Christ, that is disgusting! Gives a whole new meaning to old Riki, right? They made their way past a wandering scabby in the street, who didn't seem to notice them, oblivious to the world, just stuck wandering the street looking for his next meal. When they reached the end of the road, they turned right and their pace quickened as they passed several dead bodies hanging out of a burning bus. 
The driver had been flung from the vehicle as it careened into a wall. His body was an unrecognisable mass as the dead had devoured most of it, leaving it a husk. They passed the junction where four cars had smashed into one another. All the drivers were killed but still sat in their chairs, clawing at the air, trying to grab at them, their seatbelts the only thing preventing them from getting the trio. The creatures were groaning as if having a grunted argument. Further down the street was a group of infected huddled around a mass of gunk and blood splattered on the tarmac. Their grunts and wet munching filled the air as the three survivors looked on in horror. We need to keep moving. If we carry on down here it'll take us to the main street, where hopefully there'll be a car we can use. Pete led Danny and Cal to the left and down a lane that winded behind the buildings. Wooden fences surrounded them that backed onto gardens. And if there's not... Then run. It's not too far. It's about two miles to Princess Street. Two miles? Cal won't make two miles. I told you, he's fine. Then you carry him. Why are you making this so difficult? I'm not making it difficult. I'm being realistic. Cal was moaning behind Danny, trying to get her attention. What, Cal? What do you want? When Danny turned, she noticed the scabby coming towards them. She stepped back, pushing Cal behind her as Pete grabbed his handgun out of his holster and pointed it at the head of the old man that was shambling towards them. His trousers were baggy and he was stepping on his legs, pulling them down as he shambled towards them. His bare chest was torn to ribbons as his intestines dragged on the floor behind him, leaving a bloody trail. Pete looked around him and holstered his pistol and pulled out a knife from a pouch on his belt. The blade was about six inches long as he plunged it into the head of the man, his body collapsing to the floor, blood spraying out over his hands. The trio walked through the destruction that lay out in front of them avoiding groups of the dead as they shamble through the streets, their moans low and guttural as the smell of fresh meat wafted through the air, clinging to their rotten nostrils. They passed burnt-out cars and buses which lay empty, scorched bodies lifeless and still. It was amazing how quickly everything turned to shit, Danny thought to herself as the images filled her eyes. She constantly covered Cal's, making sure he was not seeing what she and Pete were forced to witness. Pete had to dispose of a few of the creatures, but only the ones that came too close for comfort, with a swift blade to the brain. Eventually, they reached Princess Street. Empty shops lined the streets, their windows smashed and goods strewn upon the floor, as pointless looting had taken place, people taking TVs and sporting goods when they had no need for them in the new world. But just because they could, the destruction was horrendous, and it caused a large lump in Danny's throat. How could the city fall so quickly? Why was this happening? Questions that she may never get the answer. The Fallen, an Eerie Earth production. Written and directed by Kieran Begg. Starring Andrea Waite as Margaret Cunningham. Jessica Nicholl as Olivia Dixon. Megan Chase as Danny Cunningham. Saxon Davids as Pete Kirkman. Rick Oldroyd as Abbott, and Kieran Begg as Sergeant O'Connell. Thank you for listening.